politely fuck yourself and um here we go my knuckles right into the microphone ready here we go um hello this is the triad where we're spooky but sensitive i'm hannah i'm shannon i'm shelby okay now okay. you can tell your story shelby <laughs> i had a story to tell oh my you god you were literally <laughs> mid-sentence and i told us to and we cut recording. you off <laughs> look i don't remember okay it's been it was a you long were talking about crying over socks ago. Shannon, it's I don't really have ago. a memory, okay? Oh God. Um, oh anyway, God. okay, so I melted in the back room um, because we have a worker who literally, like, every three seconds asks for help. And she doesn't ask her question. She just goes, can a manager help me? And it's, and then it's like, as soon as you walk away after fixing the problem, she's back on the walkie and she's like, something's happening and I don't understand and I'm just like figure it out I don't know what to tell you anyway Hmm. anyway I was in the back room trying to take like two seconds to breathe um after having my meltdown over fuzzy socks and um she came on the walkie and dear listeners this comes just mere hours after the <laughs> pants meltdown. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yesterday I cried over pajama pants and today I cried over fuzzy socks. Um it's fine. It's fine. Just don't work retail during holiday season, okay? But yeah, so I'm just crying over clothes this week. It's fine. Not clothes. I'm crying over the fact that people don't do what I tell them to do and the clothes are just the, you know. Mhm. They're just there. Also, Shannon and I are having more drama with our apartment, and it's fine. <sighs> yeah. Apartment drama. I got double yeah. tapped in the boob today, both <laughs> boobs, simultaneously. Yeah. We love with that. A little fist. Children are great. Mm-hmm. I love kids. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you guys another story after this, because I can't tell on the air. Okay. Okay. Oh, this one I can, though. I had to remove a child, an article of a child's clothing. Actually, I'll just it was a sweatshirt. Uh, because there was literal human shit on it. Ew. <laughs> oh, awesome. Wiping is hard, I guess. <laughs> Anything else? Let's stretch this intro out. <laughs> no, let's get into no. it. No. Yeah, I don't have anything. <sighs> okay. Do you have a PowerPoint or anything? Yes, it is six slides long, and that was generous. <laughs> Mine's only eight, so, <laughs> you know. It's fine. I thought there was going to be more information on That's this. That's how mine is. Yeah, y'all, this episode and the next one are going to be real fucking short. Yeah, <sighs> I might divulge into a lot of talk on uh, marching band, though. <laughs> so That's fine. Ooh, that might I happen. do have a lot on that. Oh, good. We'll just talk about I don't about know that. about your marching band, but my marching band I do. Oh, yes. Shelby and I can talk about college marching band, and that'll be great. She yeah. didn't do college marching band? No, I just went to a high school that was psycho, so. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I'm just going to say this for you, Shannon, because I don't think you know this. Southern marching bands are equivalent to college marching bands everywhere else because I was in one of those crazy ass ones, too. I know. Yeah, our competitions were crazy. Um, So today we're going to talk about Henry Louis Baltimore Jr. Okay. Um, My sources are BuzzFeed. The documentary and the website what happened to henry.com. Uh, the documentary is called What Happened to Henry. The Charlie Project, statenews.com, and the Claremont Sun. Okay. Um, cool. So you can go to slide three. Oh my god, I thought my notes disappeared. I almost died. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is a quote from mlive.com, which I guess I just didn't read that to you. Uh, it's the Claremont Sun. It's the same thing, I think. Yes, I'm positive. It's the Claremont Sun. Sorry. Okay. This is a quote from the Claremont Sun. Uh, quote, if life was really like TV, the police would have pulled out a weathered file, talked to a few people, and within the hour give Jackson Doris's 
ba- wait, give Jackson's Doris Baltimore the answer to a question that has troubled her for 37 years. What happened to my son, she asks. It's a mystery that has plagued the Baltimore family since May 30th, 1973, when 21-year-old Henry L. Baltimore Jr. vanished without a trace from his off-campus apartment at Michigan State University. It remains the East Lansing Police Department's oldest cold case. It is still an open case, Chief Tom Wilbert says. Missing persons cases aren't unusual, but we usually find something. This is highly unusual because there's been nothing for this long. There is no evidence of anything. He just disappeared. Hmm. So, um, Henry Lewis Baltimore Jr. was the oldest son of Doris and Henry L. Baltimore Sr. Are you guys still there, by the way? Yes. Yes. Okay. It was just really quiet. Um, he was a Cub Scout. He delivered papers for the Jackson Citizen Patriot, which is uh, a newspaper that is actually mentioned that I will mention later. Um, what state is this in? This is in Michigan. Yes. Right, right, right. Is he from Michigan or is he from somewhere else? I'm pretty sure he's from Michigan. Okay. The, again. I was just wondering. Information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's not even a, if you notice, there's not even a Wikipedia article. Yeah. Uh, makes you feel any better there is one for mine and it was not helpful at all so and the five or ten sources that i have are all the same thing over and over and over it was like Mm -hmm. really hard to get information yeah that's how mine is it's (sighs) i know that wikipedia is not the end-all be-all for like all knowledge but it's it if there's anything that doesn't have a wikipedia article like even just a headline or like a you know what i mean though like I can't think of title. Um, even if it just has that, I'm like, okay, but at least there's a Wikipedia article. Like, if there's right. nothing on it, I'm just like, but why though? Sus. Mm-hmm. It's like real suspicious to me for not any real reason. It's just weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but anyway. anyway, yeah, no, it, it was really weird. Uh, that was the first thing I tried to look for because that's what I usually use to find other sources. Yeah, that's why yeah, I did it too. There was nothing. Um, that's why I used the Charlie Project because it had it had a bunch of sources listed, which was very nice. Um, although their website needs to be updated, but you know, no judgment. Um, so a Henry bit was of judgment. a <laughs> little bit of judgment. Just <laughs> I'm just judging a little bit. Um, <laughs> Henry was a drummer and incredibly musical. Um, He graduated from Parkland High School in 1970 and enrolled at Michigan State University. So at Michigan State University, he was an honor student and worked at the university library. What? Sorry, on this picture, I kept trying to figure out why it was MSK. It's MSU. Yeah, I see that now. (laughs) It's pointy. (laughs) It's kind of weird. It, it just the little button made me think it was a K. I don't know. Yeah, okay? I'm dumb. It's fine. <laughs> no, I, I mean if you squint, kind of. I've been awake <laughs> since five a.m. Okay, it's fine. Huh. So Henry was an honor student and worked at the university library at MSU, um, Michigan State University, not Missouri State. Not that anyone would ever confuse that, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> because we're not like even on the map. Um, doesn't matter. Uh. He studied social sciences and music and planned on it, ah, and planned on going into social work when he graduated. So he was like a super good guy. Just he seems like uh, from what I saw in the documentary um, and from what I read, he was just well loved and well liked. And he just kind of um, was a bridge between a bunch of different social groups and was just kind of that person who's friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was also the first black drum major at MSU and led the Spartan marching band. Um, And one of his friends was quoted in saying that he helped further integrate the 215 piece band um, because this was the seventies. So, you know, things are still kind of rocky. Yeah. uh, Like with racial tensions and stuff. Uh, but he was just, like, so well-loved that it kind of brought the whole group together. Um, mm-hmm. So Henry's life really seemed to be on track for, like, a really bright future. Um, this is from State News. Quote, everything was in its place, Baltimore's sister Laurel Baltimore said. If he was going to run away, why not take his car? It's hard for us to believe that he's been away all this time and has not contacted his family. 
-hmm. From the day her brother disappeared, Laurel Baltimore said it was difficult to stay informed of everything the police were doing in their investigation. Her family even had to wait 48 hours after the time he disappeared before filing a missing, or before a missing persons report could be filed. I felt enough was not being done to look into the situation and the case, Laurel Baltimore said. It's very hard for me to say they weren't doing what they needed to do because they didn't give you a lot of information on, quote, this is what they're doing, end quote. I will say that, like, back then it was more of a wait a few days and then file a report kind of a thing, like, for Yeah, but you're going to see why it's, like, probably bad that they did that. Oh, no, I'm I'm assuming that that was a, like, racially motivated choice. No, 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 there's like a, there's like an incident. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. But yes, I understand. Like, no, 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 like, they shouldn't have done that ever, because, like, that never leads to anything good. That was just, like, how things were at the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any of those missing cases, missing persons cases that you hear about are always like, and we had to wait 48 hours to file a report, but had we done it, like, immediately, we would have found them, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's kind of like a really shitty, uh, I don't know. It's not even, it's not like a law or anything. It's just like a- no. It's never been a law, as far as I'm aware. It was just, that was just the procedure. Yeah, that was just the procedure. Um, Procedure, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, I'm sure most people nowadays know this, but, like, if someone you know goes missing, don't wait three days. Call them immediately. Like, call the police immediately. And if they try to tell you to wait, tell them to fuck off and file a report. Yeah. Basically. Probably don't tell them to fuck off. They won't listen. But... (laughs) (laughs) politely fuck yourself and um here we go yeah uh so okay so let's talk about what happened right before that um so you guys can go to the next slide i think this is his senior yearbook picture i'm not really sure (laughs) but he looks very dapper anyway Mm -hmm. um so this is from the state news quote march 3rd 1973 two men entered henry baltimore's 340 Oak Hill Avenue apartment and threatened him with a revolver. The men tied Baltimore to his bed springs, searched his apartment, and took about $100 in personal items such as golf clubs, clothing, and a watch. The drum major was also allegedly pistol whipped during that time. So, these two guys break into his apartment (laughs) um, and steal a bunch of his shit. So, Mm -hmm. uh, the police arrested... Roy L. Davis, who was a Flint, Michigan resident, um, in connection to the robbery. So, according to that documentary I watched, uh, uh, Henry's friends said that Davis had attended a couple of parties at Henry's campus, or off-campus apartment, uh, which Henry shared with, I think, three other roommates. It was just, like, a bunch of boys in an apartment. Um, and, you know, they were college kids in the 70s, so they were all smoking pot. Uh, Mm -hmm. so some, one of his friends had this theory that maybe Davis seeing all these kids smoking pot in this one apartment over and over kind of led him to believe that maybe they were pushing drugs or running drugs or something. Mm -hmm. And so this may have motivated Davis to commit the robbery because he suspected that maybe there were like, there was just like a lot of cash or drugs lying around. Yeah. Um, but there weren't any because... None of those kids were drug dealers. They were just, you know, college kids in the 70s. Yeah. Um, so when they broke in with just Henry home, um, that's when that whole incident happened. So he was beaten up, tied up. They stole all of that stuff. They stole, like, his roommate's really expensive golf bag. Uh, the ch- cash that was just lying around. Um, I think, like, somebody's leather coat. And then a couple of... Uh, Sweaters is what it said. Mm -hmm. Um, So Henry knew Davis, Roy Davis. He, because he had seen him at the parties uh, that he had come to, but he didn't know who the other person was. Um, So after the robbery, Henry was really shaken up. He eventually filed charges against Roy, but it took him, it took him like 10 days, I think, because he just didn't want to, he was like very scared of the whole situation because, you know, he's like, He's, like, an honor roll student, and that's, like, a scary thing to happen. Like, just some guys coming to steal from you because they think you're a drug dealer Mm -hmm. when you're actually, like, just some marching band nerd, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So 
he doesn't file charges until his father really presses him to do it. Um, so according to the Charlie Project, quote, 22-year-old 22, 22 Roy L. Davis was subsequently arrested and charged with armed robbery. Baltimore was fined $50 for failing to appear at Davis's Davis's preliminary hearing to testify against him. He resurfaced two days later and asked the police to drop the case, but they refused. He later testified at a rescheduled hearing. Baltimore told his sister that Davis had threatened to kill him and that his family stated the criminal case had been had caused him a great deal of stress. So there was a preliminary hearing to charge Davis and Henry mm -hmm. didn't show up. Uh his sister says it was because his sister was um a graduate student at msu at the time so they they like hung out together and stuff you know like yeah older sibling younger sibling thing um but henry uh confided in her that davis sort of you know threatened to kill him like came back to his house afterward after he so um henry picked him out of a lineup um at the police station before this happened and confirmed that yes davis was one of the people who came in and broke in and you know pistol whipped him and stuff mm -hmm. uh so davis came back to his house and um since he had stolen a certain amount of uh cash and items he was uh going to possibly go to prison for this so he went over to henry's apartment and sort of begged him to not press the charges uh, any further not to pursue the case. Um, so Henry tried to go and drop the um, claim that he made against Davis, but mm -hmm. the prosecutor said that he was now obligated to uh, see it through. So that's when he started getting these death threats because before Davis was like, yeah, I'll just bring everything back. I'll pay you back. I'll, I'll give you back all your stuff. Um, but then it kind of turned more violent once he said that he wasn't able to, or once Henry said he wasn't able to. So according to the Charlie Project, quote, Baltimore's 1968 Buick was found at his home an hour and a half after he was last seen. Also left behind, he also left behind his car keys, money, clothes, and other belongings. At the time of his disappearance, he lived with three roommates in an off-campus apartment in the 300 block of Oak Hill Avenue in East Lansing. Baltimore was discovered missing when his sister went to his apartment to get a paper she'd agreed to type for him. He wasn't there, and his roommate said he'd gone to the library and never returned. His sister became concerned after due to the date of due after the due date of his paper <laughs> came and went without hearing from him, and she contacted their father who went to the police. So, um if he all right. Well, actually, let's just keep going. So let's talk. Let's uh, here's a quote from state news to make a case. Baltimore had to testify against Davis in court and did so during a May 24th, 1973 preliminary e examination. After his testimony, Davis's case was bound for trial in circuit court. After Baltimore's testimony, Davis allegedly threatened him. According to witnesses, Davis asked Baltimore not to pursue charges and said, I should have killed you when I had the chance and... You're messing with my life. If you testify like you did today, I don't have anything to lose so I can pull out all the stops. Witnesses also said they saw Davis go to Baltimore's house after he testified and on the day he disappeared. So according to that documentary, I watched um, the day that uh, Henry disappeared, Davis and another man went to um, Henry's house and neighbors saw them knocking on the door uh there was a green sedan parked in the parking lot that was uh so you know how like apartments have um assigned spots for residents mm -hmm. it was parked in henry's spot or not henry's spot one of the other roommate spots because henry's car was there too um and so they saw this green car and they saw these two guys and they were just pounding and pounding on the door but it was clear that henry was probably home um but the men couldn't gain entry so uh, the the neighbors came home, saw those two guys knocking on the door, went to their apartment, were there for a couple of minutes, came out, and the men were still there knocking on the door. Um, okay. So, uh, Henry's apartment had no signs of forced entry, so somehow, perhaps they coerced him to come out, or got him to come out in some way, um, and then that was the last anyone ever saw of Henry. Um, 
So, although Davis was considered a person of interest for a while, his mother provided an alibi for him when Henry disappeared. But, um... Mm. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's so <laughs> suspicious. It's so sketchy. Well, just, um, like, don't trust alibis from moms. Like, they're gonna lie to save their kid. <laughs> moms kill for their kids. Like, Yeah, like... Come on. <laughs> um, any other thoughts or anything before we keep going? Because I'm, I'm, like... Uh, like probably fake alibi notwithstanding i'm very confused as to why this person was not blank like he very clearly was involved like i don't understand right. why it right. didn't go why like <laughs> so the day of his like circuit court hearing he went to henry's house and stayed there and was like you're not leaving you're staying here with me or the day that not his circuit court hearing his the one that uh henry got fined for for missing mm-hmm Whatever Davis went to his house been. and was like, you're not going. You're staying here. And basically, like, babysat him all day. But probably, like, with a gun. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like you do. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just very suspicious. Um, so Davis eventually went to jail for another charge. I can't remember, mm-hmm. but I didn't find out what it was. But um, it, it's, to me, he's definitely involved. Like, like so I'm sorry. Was, Davis went to Henry's house to stop him from going to court. Yes. How was the criminal who pistol whipped? That's intimidating a witness. Yes. How is he not arrested for that? (laughs) Exactly. And Henry went to the prosecutor and was like, "I don't want to pursue this any further." Yeah. Because he's threatening me, and the guy was like, "Eh, "Too bad, you gotta go." It's all very suspicious and sketchy and weird. there's so many ways that they could have given him some kind of protection. Yeah, but like you know, and like why? No, he's a black man in the seventies. What? Yeah, I mean that answers my question as to why. But uh, yep, like, <laughs> but like, it, it's so stupid because I don't know. He just seems like such a wonderful person, and then yeah, the police and the investigators and everyone were just like, yeah, fuck you, I guess. Yeah. Like, he's the drum major. Come on. He has a shiny <laughs> head. Uh, anyway, so... I just uh, have a question. Yes, please. If you're the one who brought the case, and then you are the one who goes and says, I want to drop the case, don't you have to drop it? No, you don't. You just can't then... Um. Well, okay. So, (laughs) basically, you know, you go to the police, you say, hey, X, like, Mr. X did this to me, whatever. And the police are like, okay, cool, we're going to take your statement, we're going to refer this to the prosecutor, we'll go arrest the dude, whatever. And then you go talk to the prosecutor. The prosecutor then files charges against Mr. X for whatever crime he committed. So... It would depend on the case. And this is, again, just like my law school understanding. I am not providing legal advice to anyone with what I'm saying. Um, They can still continue because at that point, the crime is more in the hands of the state. And they're going to see it as an offense against, like, the public rather than you specifically, if that makes sense. And so... In some cases, if all of the evidence is just the, like, the complainant's testimony, they probably won't pursue it because then they won't win. Because, I mean, you could still force them to testify, but it's going to be a problem and they're going to make it very clear on the stand that they don't want to be there and that's not going to look good for you. Or if there's enough evidence, you can kind of just keep going. At least from what I understand it. Um, Hold on. Keep going without... One second, I'll Google it. (laughs) Um, But yeah, which I know that's a huge thing in like sexual assault cases is Mm -hmm. that whenever the person no longer like whenever she says it's usually she that she doesn't want to continue, it's dropped. I know that that's the case. It is kind of up to the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, it can continue without you. Even if you want to withdraw it. It's different than like a civil suit because with a civil suit, it's you and Mr. X and that's it. When it's a crime, the state is then involved and you're not in charge of what's going on. The state is involved. The state is in charge of what's going on. 
I should have just said that. I wonder that. if it's because they <laughs> stole, like, enough for it to be a felony amount. Maybe. Yeah, that would be part or of it, too. That because they, like, assaulted him. Yeah, that, well, I mean, yeah, the severity of the crime would probably be a factor as well. Right. Yeah. yeah it, it said that, like, the golf clubs cost, like, $300, but they also stole a bunch of cash and, like, a nice leather jacket and a watch. Mm-hmm. So that's probably, like, enough to be... I don't know what the amount is. A lot. Um, I don't know. And I don't know what it would have been in the 70s for sure. Yeah, it was um, It was $300 in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so. Probably a lot. Yeah, well, I just meant, like, I don't know, like, what the threshold is for felony burglary instead of regular or theft or whatever crime they said it was. Petty um, larceny. Whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. No, thank you going without you. Um, it's just with sexual but assault he cases wouldn't necessarily have had to testify correct yes he would only have to testify if either the prosecution or the defense called him to testify and if that happens you have to testify and if you don't you probably will be found in contempt of court just throwing that out there for people <laughs> even if you don't want to testify <laughs> um, yeah he had to pay a 50 dollars fine because well he was like couldn't go <laughs> yeah Davis was threatening him. But But that's the thing. Like, he didn't go because he was being essentially held hostage in his own home. Yeah, but, like, Like, they didn't care. So, what I don't understand is why that wasn't added to the charges, at least. I don't know that he told them that. Okay, well, he should have. (laughs) Shannon, he was so scared. I know, I know, I know, I know. You're victim blaming! I'm I'm really not, I promise. I know, I'm (laughs) I'm coming at this from, like, a just like lawyer perspective like why wouldn't you tell them literally everything that's going on with this person who's intimidating you right um yeah yeah. i mean i don't think that telling i don't think that telling them would have changed the outcome of this any it just maybe he wouldn't have been fined 50 (laughs) dollars you know that's that's really the only difference i think that would have come out of it because i mean honestly though you know on the flip side of that if he had told them would Davis have done something to him even sooner? Like, who who knows? Exactly, because but, he, like, yeah. threatened him openly. People heard yeah. him say this stuff to his face. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. He could have been put in jail till trial. Nothing, or nothing would have happened, you know? Right. Like, we just don't know. Um, but, yeah. That could be the lesson out of this, maybe. Like, hey, guys, if someone is holding you hostage in your home so you can't go to court... Maybe tell them. <laughs> well, so you don't get fined fifty dollars at the very least. I was gonna say, but on the flip side, would they just then commit an even more atrocious act? Yeah, uh, because you. <laughs> I know. Tattled. It's yeah. It's it's who's yeah. to say? <laughs> who's to say? Yes, exactly. Um. All right, let's keep going. Okay. So. Uh, I'm just gonna read this to you because it's summed up pretty well. Uh, so this is from the state news again about the investigation. Quote, East Lansing Police Detective Steve Gonzalez said Baltimore is still classified as a missing person because no concrete evidence of a homicide or kidnapping has been found. Quote, the best option would be to find Henry's body because all indications say he's probably dead, Gonzalez says. He hasn't been seen. Let me just throw up really quick. Um, he hasn't been seen in 30... 30- That's not part of the quote. That was me editorializing. Yes. <laughs> I just had some Taco Bell. Uh, please forgive. He hasn't been seen in 33 years. I believe this is, like, also out of date. This is yeah. definitely out of date. Okay. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> he hasn't been seen in 33 years. And there's been no contact with his family for 33 years. And common sense says uh, he was the victim of a homicide. Now retired detective Jim Kelly, who was in charge of Baltimore's case in 1973, suspects the drum major was kidnapped and killed. Quote, not having him show up someplace, whether alive or dead, is unusual, he said. Because hunting season was coming up not too far, we were pretty sure his body would turn up somewhere between here and Flint. Pretty disappointing, I guess. Which, that's like, such, no offense, such shitty police yes, <laughs> work. Yes, Well, we were hoping someone would trip on it. <laughs> No one did, so I guess no it's one a did failure anyway. all around. <laughs> Maybe he ran away. Because... I just... No, but, yeah, I... Even the fact that he's still classified as a missing person, so therefore they're investigating it as a missing person and not as a homicide, like... Like, 
really, guys? Like, he very clearly is not alive anymore. Like, because he are was, you kidding me? He was doing so well in school and life in general. Like, he wouldn't yeah. just run away from that. No. Well, I mean, Like, maybe even... if he started, like, failing everything and, like, just everything's going down the tubes, yeah, someone yeah. would run away. But, like... Well, like, the only was... reason yeah. that I... I mean, obviously, I don't know this kid's entire life, but... I mean, the only thing I could think that would be, like, the catalyst for that would be this case, but it didn't seem like that was something he wanted to run away over, if that makes sense. No, I mean, he was still going to school. He still yeah. was, like close with his family he had all of his friends he was still the friggin' drum major yeah like i don't well plus like the day he vanished those guys were just like trying to break into his apartment like (laughs) yeah but you know his body didn't turn up when a hunter was out stalking a deer so yeah (laughs) yeah i just and that's the whole thing too like i really hate when people are like oh they just ran away but then their family members are like no we're not like we actually all like each other. He wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, he was... You know? <laughs> he wasn't the oldest child, but he was the oldest boy, and it seemed like all of his other brothers really idolized him. He had, mm-hmm. like, eight, I think there were eight kids in the family. Yeah. But, like, he was totally idolized. He was just like, oh, everyone wants to be like Henry because he's so great, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Yeah, well, and it seemed like he liked his family too and so like i yeah again i don't know this kid's life but i don't see him just a no he seems family. really close to his family yeah his sister and brother were on the documentary and they described him as being like just so full of life and like yeah everyone like he loved him just and... up and leave without telling them what was going on maybe he wouldn't say where he was going like just for his own safety but he wouldn't just like up and leave yeah his sister lived down the block from him he could have just been like hey i'm gonna you know go home and also wouldn't he take his own car that was what i was about to ask was wasn't his car still there and like was there stuff like and all of his belongings so like nothing was missing where would his yeah he's (laughs) totally a runaway (laughs) so stupid it was so yeah Mm. no one runs away with nothing of their own no right they don't exactly all of his personal belongings and his car like if you're gonna run away at least take your car seriously like you're at least gonna have like a favorite book or a favorite like i would take my freaking pillow because i can't sleep without it so like i would take some underwear (laughs) like you would take he didn't have anything with it yeah like Like, my medication my glasses like i would need my dog like i would need no one is straight up running away with absolutely nothing no they're not get the car running away i just like it's just so like no (laughs) it's very bizarre that he's still classified as a missing person yeah he's like clearly a homicide he's very clearly never been like a missing person in that sense this has always been a homicide case and the fact that they haven't treated it that way is horrible so that's why i said it was really stupid that they wait Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't let the family file the missing persons report immediately because the thing with davis had just happened yeah and he missed the he missed the trial yeah and so like i don't know yeah it's just I think it's really dumb like, that they're like, well, I guess we'll have to wait because, Was you know, Davis related to one of the cops or something? Like, what the no, heck? <laughs> Davis was just some dude from Flint. Like. Um, oh, man. But let's keep going. This yeah. is back in that article. Quote, Kelly said the police have dental records for Baltimore, which help, which will help police pursue leads. The emergence of DNA technology. Oh, my God. Why can't I read? But the emergence of. <laughs> That would be good. But the emergence of DNA technology, which was unavailable in 1973, might make a difference, he said. Gonzalez said Baltimore's family members' DNA has already been collected to create a DNA profile of Baltimore, which was entered into a national missing persons database. It was entered into CODIS. Um, yeah. They, I don't know why they didn't just say that, but <laughs> that's where it is. <laughs> um if there's any unknown individual or remains, DNA can be compared with the database and there is a possibility of a match, he said. Gonzalez said he works on the case whenever more recent caseloads for the department are low. Ideally, police would like to find Baltimore. Gonzalez said his goal is to at least update the case and he is following new leads. The last report regarding Baltimore was filed in 1980, he said. So, um... Yeah, there's 
not a whole lot besides that. He Mm -hmm. is missing. Uh, There was that weird stuff with Davis, which I'm not accusing anyone of murder, but... (laughs) No, we are very... Kind of... We are very emphatically not accusing anybody of murder. Please don't sue us. Allegedly. Uh, <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Um, We're gonna no, say I just that think it's, it's very suspicious. suspicious. That's all and I'm there saying. was another person there was another person involved. It wasn't just Davis. There was that second person who yeah. initially robbed him and then potentially was the same person who came back later. Yeah. Uh, the day that he disappeared. Oh man. Um, yeah, so do we know if Gonzalez is still alive? Uh, Gonzalez, yes, one... Gonzalez is like a new person in the. Okay. The, in the in the office, he's not like an old. He inherited man. the case. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Um, quote: The Baltimore family have been forever frustrated by lack of any news. Doris, his mother, said, "There's always been family concern that." Why can't I read? There's always been family concern that because of the era, police might have falsely considered Henry just another black kid in trouble, Lonnie said. Lonnie is his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, last slide. definitely did that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, that I will accuse. Wow, I spelled of. that wrong. I spelled it wrong twice. <laughs> no, wait, I copy and pasted that, so they spelled it wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, I definitely spelled it right because I used to live on that street. Anyway, so... (laughs) uh, Since his disappearance, Henry's parents and and two of his brothers have passed away. The family is still looking for answers, so if you or someone you know has any information on Henry Lewis Baltimore Jr.'s disappearance, please contact the East Lansing Police Department at 517-319-6811 or 517-351-4220. Um, so just to make it a bummer at the end, here are some quotes from his sister, Laurel. Quote, I have dreams that one day Henry will walk back into the house while my mother is still alive, Laurel said. My gut feeling, my gut level feeling though, is that I can't imagine he's gone, he's been gone all this time and not said something or did something to let us know he's okay. We haven't had any closure, anything anyone does to keep it out there so it doesn't get lost. Um, so she just wants his story to be told. Uh, so the yeah. documentary that I watched, um, it's on YouTube. It's about 25 minutes. It's just, it's like a student made documentary. It's very good. Uh, it just interviews some family members and his friends from school. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just kind of a lovely tribute to him. I think that most of the people in it are under the assumption that something did happen to him and that he was probably murdered yeah um but it is a very touching tribute and i recommend watching it like i said it's only 25 minutes it's called what happened to henry um but that is the story of henry lewis baltimore jr (gasps) any questions no i'm just frustrated that i know the police are consistently so bad at their jobs it's a bummer (laughs) It is a bummer. Um, I just don't know how to deal with missing persons in any era at any time point. Especially not if they're not white. Well, here's like a positive thing that we can spin it. So let's get let's get out of that. <laughs> let's get out of that dark, deep, dark hole. Um, so his sister in the documentary said that he was just so like passionate about band that he would like make new drum set not like sets like play like what's like the word that normal people use what a kit drum kit no 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 no. set as in uh music like he would write drum music for the marching band oh okay yeah um and he would come up with moves and stuff that people weren't typically doing in parades so you know how now people are like crazy and dance all the time in Mm -hmm. marching band parades and are like psychotic um (laughs) He was, like, one of the kids who invented that. Who was like, hey, let's do this in the parade. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Swing your sticks around like crazy people. Uh, 
He was, like, one of the kids who brought that to his high school and then later to the college. Mm -hmm. And um, he used to do, like, this really crazy... I don't know if he came up with it or if it was just something their band did. Um, But at MSU, he did, like, this... in, In the picture, you can kind of see him doing it. When he got onto the field, he would lean back super duper far and then do this crazy high step, marching all the way out to the field where he was supposed to stand. Mm-hmm. That is um, so, so hard to do. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> so much core like strength. my back hurts with you just doing that. <laughs> but do you see him, like, coming down with his high yeah. step? Yeah. Yeah. So he was, like, a really great musician and probably, like, the coolest drum major. I would have loved to be in that band. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway. You know, I, eh, there was, like, maybe one cool drum major in Missouri State who wasn't terrible. Maybe a couple. Whoa, full offense. Our high school ones were, <laughs> you weren't a drum major. At Missouri State? I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the people that I knew. Okay, well, one of them kind of yes. sexually harassed me for an entire year, so, Shannon, you know, there's I that. agree. <laughs> there were... <laughs> one out of four is, a, is bad, I agree, but... Yeah. The other three were great people. That's what I'm saying. Oh, I'm trying to remember. I knew them all personally. The one that you're talking about, yes, total douchebag. Yeah. Hated him. Yeah. The other three were really great people, and they've gone on to lead happy, productive lives without being <laughs> creepy. <laughs> no, I'm just remembering one of them was just... Uh, never mind. We'll get into it on a separate thing, but... <laughs> <Yes>. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Uh, our ending is that we have no ending. <laughs> I, I'm calling this. Goodbye. Okay, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Triad. Our music is by Scott Buckley. Our audio is recorded by our sound engineers, Craig Bott and Audrey Credo. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, YouTube, and Tumblr as The Triad Podcast. We're also on Patreon as The Triad. Currently, all Patreon funds will go towards the cost of hosting the show. Each tier has its own rewards, but every patron receives our undying gratitude. Do you have comments, questions, or stories? Email us at thetriadpod at gmail.com. And thank you again for listening to The Triad, where we're spooky but sensitive.